sweet. Thank you. Um, so yeah, in common with everyone else, the six minute, 40 seconds is uh, a little bit of a, a challenge and probably more challenging than in fact the, the subject matter. Um, I'm conscious that there's a mixed audience here. Can I ask just for starters, uh, who has done a thoracotomy? Okay. If you want to go to the bar now, or <laughs> go for learning with liquor or something like that, that would be fine. Um, I suppose it does kind of still put me in the more experienced half of the room, but that's my background with our academy. Um, so that's the perspective I'm talking from. Uh, so expert, not quite, more experienced than most, maybe. Uh, and I was trying to think of a way that we could liven this up and make it a little bit more interactive. Uh, on the way down, um, there's obviously lots of lots of sheep, but uh, I'm told that interfering with sheep is frowned upon. Uh, and in six minutes, it will be a little bit much to get it cleaned up after us, though we could probably have done it. So, um, what I'm going to try and do is talk about the who, where, what, how, <coughs> when uh, of emergency for a straddling both hospital uh, and pre hospital. Uh, obviously, with uh, Gareth and some of our colleagues in the UK, there's a lot of experience from pre hospital. <laughs> Uh, pre hospital power property setting, I, I think for much of the world, we're probably still talking about emergency departments uh, or in hospital power companies. Uh, I suppose the, tra the traditional dogma, if you can have a dogma about a, a rare procedure, is that it will be for penetrating trauma uh, to the chest uh, and principally to either relieve cardiac tamponade or to deal with a single uh, left ventricular laceration. Uh, increasingly, we've seen a shift in the evidence, which uh, is, is always a good thing towards considering it for certain types of blunt trauma and potentially more complex interventions. Um, I suppose to set the scene, rather than go straight into, into the, the, the talking, uh, I thought I'd just take you very briefly through uh, my case, which was uh, a man who had been stabbed in the left chest. I was in the ED, uh, and we got about a six minute heads up, which uh, psychologically for me uh, was perfect. It was just enough time uh, to get in the frame of mind to find a scalpel and a pair of gloves, uh, and not quite enough time for cardiothoracics to get there and steal my thunder. Um, and I suppose I had in my head very simply that this, this was either it was going to be binary, we're either going to do it or not, and it wasn't going to be a whole lot of middle ground. So the patient arrived, he was a single stab wound, that's not it, but looked pretty much like that to his left chest. Uh, the PA rate was about 48 beats per minute. CPR was ongoing, he'd been chewed, he'd IO access, he'd had some adrenaline or epinephrine from the States, um, he had some saline, uh, and he was taking the odd agonal gasp. Um, so, you know, that was, that was kind of what I'd envisaged as, as, as the, the candidate. He had CPR, there was no effective output. Um, so we did bilateral thoracostomies, the right revealed nothing, the left was a whole pile of blood came out. Uh, he was still in cardiac arrest. Uh, we enacted the massive transfusion protocol, uh, did have the backup of some very good ED staff and some good ICU staff who took care of uh, the airway and vascular access. Um, and uh, I suppose our options really were either stop resuscitation there and then or proceed to a thoracotomy. Uh, so we said we'd crack on. Uh, so we did a clamshell approach, and again, this isn't him, I do have some pictures, but I think probably best not to, not to show us. This is one of uh, Garrett's, I think. Uh, Open, open the, the chest by connecting the two for our and found a very, very weakly contracted part. Fli flicker, not fibrillation, but barely uh, beating at all. In fact, it was empty, uh, and therefore there was minimal bleeding because it was all in my shoes. Um, there was some tamponade, open the pericard, and the pericardic arrived at that stage, which was uh, grand. Um, they closed the left uh, ventricle laceration, otherwise it would have been a case of finger in the hole. He got some blood, he went into BF, we thought the clam shall be shot him. Uh, the heart took off like a rabbit full of blood and adrenaline. He went to theatre. Unfortunately, he did have a hypoxic brain injury and he, he died several days later. Um, but I, I thought that was a fairly legitimate case of, of, of uh, an attempt at a resuscitative thoracotomy. Uh, and I suppose highlights some of the indications that we might have for it, principally releasing tamponade, because sticking a needle into a pericard and full of clot isn't really going to work. Uh, potentially cro controlling any massive hemorrhage, although I say this guy pretty much exsanguinated, there was nothing left to control. Uh, doing internal cardiac massage, uh, and Kareem Rohi talked, uh, I think, about that in, uh, in, in London as a possible technique for medical cardiac arrests. Uh, and if you don't have Reboa, uh, well, you could include the aorta by just pushing it against the vertical column, and that might buy you a little bit of time as well. Um, in terms of evidence, there is quite a bit now. Um, going back, back in time, a uh, paper from, the, from 2000, patients with penetrating chest trauma who arrested at the scene all died. 
those who rested in the ambulance, the most of them died. If they rested in ED, nearly one in five survived. Uh, another paper going back to the 60s, uh, less than 20% of patients with penetrating chest wounds to the heart reached hospital alive. And an interesting paper from 95, which has uh, uh, been repeated just this month, no difference in survival by, for patients with penetrating chest trauma, whether they're brought to hospital uh, by EMS or by the police or by bystanders. So potentially the, the, the dogma of how we treat penetrating trauma and arrests is shifting. ATLS would have a very dogmatic approach. These are your indications. There's got to be some signs of life, some penetration chest injury, and you've got to be a surgeon qualified by training and experience. Well, that wasn't me. Uh, ACF would have taken a fairly similar approach, uh, but did have a good pool of data in terms of survival, obviously favoring the, the penetrating trauma over the blunt. Um, in Iceland 2012 in Dublin, uh, Tim, Tim Harris gave a very good talk on this, and the take home message for me from that was that in traumatic cardiac arrest, really the role of CPR is limited. Uh, they're either tamping out of the tension or they've exsanguinated, and compressing an empty heart or an obstructed heart isn't going to work. Uh, and therefore, the role of CPR of adrenaline and the, the standard ALS management is limited. Um, but there are a series of patients who've had pre hospital CPR, who've had thoracotomies, uh, and who have survived. And it's difficult to do nothing if that is the limit of your scope of practice. Uh, people have tried to um, formalize that in guidelines, which is difficult. That's the Sydney Hems one, which I think is ideal. Um, but the bottom line is there are the indications penetrating trauma maybe blunt trauma with uh, evidence of tamponade on an ultrasound. Who does it? Well, whoever is capable at the time, wherever it happens. Um, it's difficult to train for. Okay, simulation, as we've heard already, creating a realistic simulation scenario is tricky. I think Cliff Reed summed it up well when he said, the most high fidelity simulator on the planet is the human brain. That's what I have going in. Uh, that, you know, you can think your way through this, you can know what you're going to do. And I suppose my learning points were that uh, the psychomotor skills of doing a thorough copy, you can put in a chest and use the scissors, they're relatively easy. Uh, so the decision to do it and what you do once you've opened the chest, that was challenging. Uh, it is messy. The temptation to open the chest and think you've got the end result uh, is there, whereas in fact that's just the start of opening the pericardium uh, or, or, or closing the clot. Uh, and I suppose conscious that we've got um, a large pre hospital audience here, uh, clearly it's a physician restricted role at, at the present. There's no reason that you can't train anybody to do this. Um, but clearly that's not on the horizon. And I suppose for EMS with the penetrating chest arrest, the messages will be CPR is of limited value, as I say, it's hard to do nothing, but pre-alerting the ED and minimizing their transport time so they, they get to the scalpel uh, before they've exsanguinated while there still is a chance to, uh, to remedy the situation. That's a bit more than six minutes for us.